And how many know, like, God doesn't want us to be normal, Amen. natural. We weren't created to be natural. We were created to be supernatural, Amen. naturally. Did you get that? We weren't created to be natural. We were created to be supernatural, naturally. Yeah, <laughs> naturally, naturally. In other words, it doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be heavy. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm having fun right now. Was this fun? Was this fun? This was fun. See, I love this. And, and it's the unforced rhythms of grace. And so I'm going to teach you a little bit more. Uh, I'm going to try to finish. You can put my house up there. And this is under the heading of protect this house, okay? Protect this house. And, and I'm trying to get done. But this is the very heart of who we are. And hopefully I'm going to share some things with you today that are going to help you personally. They're going to help you in your marriage, in your family, in your neighborhood, amen, in our church, in our community, in our county, in our state, in our country, and then we'll go to the whole world, amen? But it starts with you and me individually. Because how many know if you don't win the battle up here between your ears, you're not going very far in life? Amen. It all starts right up here. This right up here between your ears are the gates of heaven. But guess what? The gates of hell are up there too. Right up here in your head. And guess who the doorkeeper, guess who the gatekeeper is? You need to be quiet just a little bit there, please. The gatekeeper is you. The gatekeeper is me for this house right here. Amen? And this can be the gates of heaven. How many blessed with your tongue, blessed with your thoughts, but how many have opened the gates of hell right out of here? You don't have to raise your hand, but you're probably like, yeah, Pastor, that's me, both hands. How many have released hell right up here? We all have. Don't look at me like that. Come on now. Come on, right? A few choice words. Let them have it, amen. Open the floodgates of hell right out of, right out of here. So how many know, you, you, we've, I'm trying to help us understand that when God created us, he created us in his image. And he gave us this beautiful body, but he gave us a mind. He gave, we're the only ones of God's creation who he has given the ability to think about what we think about. How many know a fool doesn't think about what he thinks about? A wise person, though, brings every thought captive and thinks about what he's thinking about. He, he's a good doorkeeper. He's a good gatekeeper. Amen? He said, nope, that thought, you don't get in here. This thought, you come on in. Is it life? Is it death? Is it good? Is it evil? And let me just tell you. From the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, me too, this thing's going on. Do I hear an amen? I mean, when you get up, the war's on, and you are your gatekeeper. You know, I'm, and I'm just sharing, and if you have your Bibles, we're going to start in Psalms 84, 10. And, but I just want to say, when it comes to joy, how many, how many want to have joy in your life? Let me tell you, you're gonna, if you're going to want to walk in consistent joy, and by the way, joy is our strength, amen? How many want to be happy? Okay, well, here's, here's, here's just an example of where we're going to go today. See, happiness is triggered externally. Joy is triggered internally. In other words, people say, boy, my joy today is going to, you know, if, if you let your joy be dependent upon the external, you're going to be in big trouble. Because in order for you to have joy, which is your strength, then when you get up in the morning, now I got a perfect wife. She's amazing. So she's never the problem. But how many know if you got kids, how many got kids? See, if, if, you're, if your joy is going to be dependent upon the external, then all your kids are going to have to get up like little angels that day. And then they're going to have to all be kind. How many know that happens about never? They take turns being grumpy, don't they? And then when you get to work, all those moody coworkers, they're going to have to be perfect. You believe in miracles? 
<laughs> How many know that probably ain't going to happen? And, and grandma and grandpa and everybody's going to happen because it's all dependent upon what's going on around you, whether you're going to be happy today, whether you're going to have joy today. But if you can learn to be the gatekeeper and you don't let the external control you, that's a powerful person right there. See, I'm not going to let you control me today. I'm not going to let you push my buttons. You know, I'm going to try to go buttonless today. Because I'm telling you, all the things around you, you know, and like, that's why some people are never happy. And, and, and they're de- they become codependent. Man, if I could just get my husband to line up, if I could just get my kids to straighten up, if I could just get those crazy coworkers to straighten up. It ain't going to happen, you guys. You're going to have to use this gate up here to say, you know what? I ain't letting, I ain't letting the fence in. I ain't letting that gossip in. I'm not letting that garbage in up here. I'm the doorkeeper to my house. You ain't going to steal my joy. There is power in joy. If the devil can't steal your joy, he can't get you. But how many people, just one little thing goes wrong. Oh, why does it always happen to me? Why is it me? Why is it me? So you, a powerful person, says, no, I am no longer a victim. Nobody owes me anything. I didn't get up today to be served. I got up today to serve. Amen. I didn't get up today for anybody but him. Amen. Now, it ain't easy to do, but I'm trying to do it more and more. And I get, some days it's hard, man. And I've been trying to be a better husband, trying to be a better father. Self-centeredness is the root of all grief. Usually when there's a problem, it's all about me. Internal. I mean, that's a bad kind of internal self-centeredness. But I'm telling you, there's a place in God where you can just say, you know what? I've learned that if I let you offend me, I'm the loser. Amen? Amen? And so that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. So, so we're talking about the the gatekeeper. And how many know we got a bunch of people back here and they got little gatekeeper badges on? Steve, and we've got a great security team and, and they're trying their best. But the gatekeepers are kind of like stand at the door. I talked about a couple weeks like spiritual bouncers. Amen? But how many know like we all need a spiritual bouncer? Guess who the Holy Spirit is? He's our spiritual bouncer. Amen? And when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, he'll, he'll help you stand at your door. He'll help you discern whether that gets in or that has to stay out. Amen. A thought can come in or a thought can go out. And let me just tell you, we all got to be ha- bouncers. You know how many know, like, you need to be a good bouncer for your house. And learn to say, no, not this time. Anxiety, I'm done with you. Worry, you're not this time. Cares of this life. Not this time. He will keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. Perfect peace. Ain't too many people experience perfect peace. How are you going to do that? You're going to have to be a good gatekeeper. He will keep you in perfect peace if you can control the gate. Quit letting that word. Jesus said, do not worry. Amen? Okay. And it says in Psalms 8410, it says, Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Who I believe that. Amen? I love doing what we did today. This is like Super Bowl for me every Sunday. And we did it Friday. We did it last night. You know, we did, like, this has been beautiful. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper, a gatekeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. And see, it talks about these doorkeepers, gatekeepers. And then, you know, in 2 Samuel 19, 8, we talked about two weeks ago, and that was David. And David had done a lot of things wrong. A lot of collateral damage. He got infected into his family. His own son Absalom tried to overthrow his kingdom. And in that attempt to overthrow his dad's kingdom, his beautiful hair got caught in the tree. And Mo, uh, Joab was able to kill his David's own son Absalom. 
and it just, the regret, the pain, it's his fault. And it caused him to get out of the gate. And David was not in the gate. And he was, he was weeping, and, and all the people had a great victory that day. And Joab said, jo- David, you need to get back in the gate. Because you have turned victory into mourning instead of mourning into victory. And Moab came in, got in his face a little bit, said, David, you better get back in the gate because you ain't seen nothing bad yet if you don't give up and get in the gate. And it says right there, it says, then the king arose and sat in the gate. And that's a place of power. It's a place of authority. It's a place of judgment and justice. And it says, and David went and sat in the gate, and they told all the people, saying, there is a king sitting in the gate. So all the people came before the king. And I just, you know, and I said two weeks ago, you probably don't remember, but we need to say, listen, we need to say, I'm back. I'm back in the gate. I'm back in the gate. And that's that's a powerful place to be. And then there's one other verse, and then we're going to jump into some things here. Isaiah 28, 5 through 6. And this is, this is an amazing passage, but we're just going to touch on these few verses. In that day, the Lord of hosts will be for a crown of glory and a diadem. And some people's Bible says a wreath. And how many know the wreath there was a, was a symbol of victory? And like, you know, at the, like, where the, where the, what do they do when they race the horses? That's what I think the Kentucky Derby. Remember how they always have a wreath, and that's a sign. They give that to the horse, the victor, you know. So it says, and the Lord will be a crown of glory and a diadem or a wreath of beauty to the remnant of his people for a spirit of justice to him who sits in judgment and for strength to those who turn back the battle at the gate. Anybody been in any battles lately? How many know the battlefield is the mind? Jo- Hello, Joyce. Hello, Joyce. But see, how many start to see, wait a minute. I'm the gatekeeper. I'm the gatekeeper. Get back in the gate. Maybe you've blown it. Maybe you're struggling with regret as a parent. I don't know what you're going through. Maybe everything's falling apart in your life. But let me give you some advice. Here's what we all need to do. We need to get up and get back in the gate. Amen? Take your place. You've been seated with Christ Jesus in heavenly places. That's where you belong. In a place where you get to make, see, people say we're a judgment-free zone. And that's what I'm talking about. When I talk about judgment-free, I'm talking about we're not judging people for how they dress, how they look, what, what they, all that kind of stuff. But how many know every single day you have to make judgments? You have to judge your thoughts. Is this life or is this death? Is this good or is this bad? Is this light or is this dark? You got to make that judgment. Because if you don't make it, somebody else will make it for you. Amen? I always tell people, if you don't take control, self-control, self will take control. But you have the ability through God to think about what you think about. You have the power through the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and Jesus Christ to control the doors and the windows and the gates. Right up here. Amen? And so it says, and how many know where are we supposed to turn back the enemy? Everybody say, at the gate. At the gate. At the gate. See, you got to deal with it when it's a thought. Because if you don't deal with it when it's a thought, I'm going to talk to somebody right here. And then you start to let it in. You let it in. Then you're thinking about it. Now you're making provision for the flesh. That means to start strategizing, meditating, anxiety. See, all anxiety is just meditating on the wrong thing. People say, oh, I could never meditate all day. Well, you do it in worrying. (laughs) Amen? How many can worry all day and all night? How many have been anxious all day and all night? Day and night, nine day. Or you can think on these things that are lovely, that are beautiful, my God's got me. My worst case scenario is so good, I can't wait. Amen? <laughs> I can't wait. So, so anyway, you've got to do this at the gate. And see, the gatekeeper, it's an honorable position. It's a trusted position. 
It's sacred. It's a great responsibility because the gatekeeper is the one who gets to open or close. Open or close, okay? So we're going to look at just a few things. I'm going to use this board up here. And I always think sometimes, and some of you seen me do this before, but we're going to start with my famous stick man. And I wish that was me, but that's not even close. <laughs> I know that's a weird looking head. Now, how many can see where I'm going with this? See, it says a man in Proverbs, Proverbs number 25, verse 28. That He don't have that verse, but it says a person, a man, a woman without self-control is like a house with all its windows and doors broken out. And if the windows and doors are broken out, how many know the thief can just come right in and kill, steal, and destroy? There's not even, you, you can't be the doorkeeper because you ain't got a door. You ain't got no windows. The devil's having a heyday right up here in your head. And how do we get a door? You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Amen? You shall know the truth. See, I've been telling you some truth already here this morning. And, and all of a sudden, the house that had no windows Get some new windows and some new doors. And I always tell people these windows and doors are bulletproof. Amen? They're devil-proof. When you know the truth, you hide the word of God in your heart, then all of a sudden you can, you can remodel this house up here where now the devil, he used to come in and have a heyday with you every day. Now he can't even get in anymore. Amen? Because you done remodeled your house and you got yourself some new windows and some new doors. Amen? It's called the word of God, the truth of God's word. And when you get the truth, when the lie comes, the, the truth will expel and cast out the lie. Am I right about that? And so anyway, uh, you can kind of see this first place that we got to be the gatekeeper is personal. You as an individual, me as an individual, we've got to take control of our own house. Nobody can control your thoughts but you, you know. I know my wife would love to be able to control mine, but she can't. You know what I'm saying? And I can't control yours. You can't control mine. You have been given the power to be your gatekeeper and doorkeeper to your house. And if you want peace, you're going to have to be a spiritual bouncer. You have to stand at your door and say, listen, worries, you ain't getting in here today. Anxiety, not, not today. Stress, not today. Am I right about that? Okay, and so, so we're, we're not going to spend a lot of time, but how many know you have ear gates? Everybody say ear gates. Eye gates. Smell gates. Touch gates. Taste gates. And how many know it's not, you know, you know all those things is where the enemy gets in. How many know the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life? Am I right about that? So how many can see? You got to control your window gates, your eye, your ear gates, your eye gates. Yes, I'll throw in the tongue gate. Because how many know we can abuse that too? Amen. Go by your feelings all the time. How many know you're going to be all over the place? You go by your feelings. You have to exercise your senses unto godliness. That ain't easy to do, is it? And so, uh, so those are the things we talked about there. And so, you know, and so how many know, we got, everybody say, protect this house. Protect this house. Because when we come together and every one of us as individuals are spending the week being a good bouncer and, and being a good doorkeeper, and we come together, we're going to be in a whole lot better condition to see the kingdom of God explode. It went all week long. We've been, you know, the devil's has been having a heyday right up here in our head. And we got to come to church just to try to get revived every week. What if you came revived every week? See, people come to get filled. What if you came filled? What if you came ready? So they didn't come to, oh, I hope the pastor can preach me a good sermon. Bring me back to life again this week. I'm like, where's the people that are full of life? That are being the gatekeeper right up here. Because if you don't do it, and you know, and let me just say this. The Bible says in, 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 in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. 
The weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, but they're mighty through God, through the pulling down of strongholds. Strongholds are right up here in your head. Bad habits, right up here in your head. And the weapons of our warfare, they're mighty through God through the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. Shut the door. And every high thing or thought that tries to exalt itself against the knowledge of God, the truth, bringing into captivity every thought at the gate. See, what happens at the gate, the, the elders would sit at the gate, and then when people would come to the gate, they would discern and make a judgment. No, you can't get in. Yes, you can come in bringing every thought captive unto the obedience of Jesus Christ, the Word of God, casting down everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. You know, it says in Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, dividing asunder between the bone and the marrow, the soul and the spirit, and is a discerner, everybody say discerner, is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Everybody say discerner. The word discerner there is a judicial word. It is what the judge does in the courtroom. And basically being a good gatekeeper is you're going to set up court in the gate. And every thought that comes in, you bring it captive and you say, wait a minute, we're going to court. And we're going to put this thought on trial. And we're going to let the spirit of justice and judgment judge if that thought is life or death, good or bad, dark or light, blessing or cursing. Amen? And then the judge makes the final decision. Listen. You're the judge. You're the gatekeeper. You can bring, we're the only ones of God's creation who can think about what we think about. You have the power to bring every thought captive, and as you think, so you'll be. You got to quit letting some of that stuff in. Amen? And how many know when it comes to drugs, you put that in your mouth? You open the door, you're under the influence. And you can just go right on down the road, amen? You're the, you're the gatekeeper, you're the doorkeeper. And everybody say the gap. When I was getting ready this week, I used to teach on this. I got a whole bunch of new people. The gap, let me just do this real quick. See this line right here? Forget this. Anybody, do you see a gap up there? There is no gap, is there? Everybody look at that little line. I'm going to say there's no gap. And, th and that's a picture of a fool right there. And I'm not pointing the finger at anybody. We've all been here and done it. But let's just say anger. Anybody ever have trouble? Don't raise your hand. Anger, yeah. <laughs> anger. Okay, but there's no gap. So here's how this works. If you're not going to take control, if you're not going to develop this, then all of a sudden here comes an anger, a thought of anger. And because there is no gap, that thought comes and boom, you just punch somebody in the nose or cuss them out. Anybody just lose it just like that? That's what a fool does, amen? The thought comes, boom, you do it before you even think. I've done this to my wife many times. As soon as I said it, I said, I didn't use the gap. <laughs> I'm in trouble now, amen? Anybody know what I'm talking about? See, that's what a fool does. The thought comes, there's no doorkeeper, there's no bouncer. The thought, we let the thought come, boom, we just say it. And how many know, how many done this? As soon as you said it, you knew it was wrong. Ooh, I wish I'd have captured that one before I said it. But it's too late now, isn't it? Gossip's like that. Have you ever gossiped and as soon as you did? Ooh, I wasn't a very good gatekeeper right there. And so, but look what can happen here. This, this is what I'm talking about, you guys. This is why I'm teaching this. This is one of the most important things I could ever teach you. Because as you think, so you'll be. What you've got to do is through the Word of God and the Holy Spirit begin to develop the ability to be the doorkeeper, to be the gatekeeper, to be the spiritual bouncer. Come on, you need some gaps. And what a gap happens is all of a sudden now some truth comes, and so now you got this little gap here. So when the thought comes, you got just a couple seconds right there to bring that thought captive 
and set up court and put that thought on trial. You do that in the gap. But here's what I've learned. If you're having trouble in an area of your life, you can widen the gap by studying God's word in that area of your life. Amen. If you find God's truth in the area that you have no gap that you're struggling with, you can widen that gap to where that thought comes. You say, wait just a minute there. I recognize this thought. This thought's taking me to hell a lot of times. Amen. And I'm going to bring now, I'm setting up court right now. And we're going to judge it by the word of God. And I'm going to cast down every argument, every high thing and thought that tries to exalt itself against the truth of God, bringing into captivity every thought unto the obedience of Jesus Christ. Everybody say gatekeeper. Hey, gatekeeper. And let me tell you, when can we start practicing this? Right now. Because here in a minute, you know, like a lot of stuff's going to start going through your head. I always tell people this. You are where your mind is. You are where your mind is. So here, you know, so, so how many know, like, all day long, all day long, okay? And so I'm not going to get into that anymore because I want to move forward, but how many think this is, this is, we've got to protect this house. I would say protect, protect this house, okay? Okay, and let me just erase this. And now we're going to move on, and uh, I'm going to draw another one. So it's got to start there. And let me just say this, dads, moms, you know, you are the, Dad, you are the gatekeeper for your house. And in some cases, moms, single mom, you guys are awesome. Single dad, you guys are awesome. But you are the gatekeeper. Husbands, you're the priest of the home. It's your responsibility to take care of the gate of your house. So it's got to start individually, okay? But then I'm going to draw something else here. It's kind of the same. But this is... Notice there's no stick, man. This is just your home, okay? Everybody say your home, where you live, your neighborhood. That's just our house, your house. And how many know there's a whole other realm here? How many know you can tell a lot by going into somebody's home? There's, a, there's an atmosphere. And let me tell you, you better keep the gate over your house, Right? Who's the doorkeeper? Who's the gatekeeper? I'm talking about your physical house where you go home, your neighborhood. It starts with the husbands. Oh, it's quiet in here. It starts with the husbands. You can't blame your wife. You're the priest of the home. But if you don't have a husband, moms, moms are amazing. Women are amazing. I always tell people, he... He formed man, but he fashioned woman. Women are amazing. God, when God made a woman, he put it all together. That's why they can multitask. They can do amazing things. There's amazing women in this room right now. Amazing. But let me just tell you, you have to take charge. You have to become the gatekeeper over your house. Amen? And then the eyes in your house could be little things called computers and cell phones and televisions. It is quiet in here this morning. How many of you let stuff right on in? Right on in. Right on in, you know? And I don't really even need to go much farther. But at some point, you got to say, I can't let that in my house. That can't come in here. And be the kind of house I want this to be. Amen? Everybody say gatekeeper. Gatekeeper. Doorkeeper, you know. And so your family, your home, you know, you're the priest. It's about your neighborhood. How many know like the iniquities of the father can be passed down to the third and the fourth generation? How many want to put a stop to that? Well, you're the doorkeeper. Come on. You get up and say, hey, it ran in my family till it ran into me. Amen. Amen? It stops here. Amen? It's not going to go on down the road to the next third and fourth generation. And see, because why? You have power. You have authority. You're a child of the Most High God. Amen? Come on, rise up and get back in the gate. Amen? Get back in the gate and say, I'm taking charge over my house. And And then how about this? What about the whole neighborhood? Maybe God planted you in your neighborhood because he wants you to be the spiritual 
overseer of that whole neighborhood and say, darkness, demons, you got to leave this neighborhood right now. Drug houses, you got to shut down in Jesus' name. We pray for the drug dealers. We love them. Get them saved. They'll be on fire for Jesus. Amen. But just pray. See, when I drive through this neighborhood, I did this morning, I pray for pastors in this town, and I pray for Pastor Charles, and I pray for Pastor James, and I pray for Pastor Bo, and I pray for Pastor Brian. I do this every week, and I say, Lord, when the, when the tide comes in, all the ships rise. Who's taking authority over your neighborhood? You're called to take authority over your neighborhood. If you don't do it, who's going to do it? So everybody say, so how many see this at a different level? It starts with the individual, then it goes to your home, your neighborhood. And you say, well, who do you think you are? I'm a child of the Most High God. How about you? I got the name of Jesus. Amen. He made us and put us in authority. He said, go take dominion. Go take dominion. We're supposed to be ruling and reigning with Christ. Not the devil, you know? And so how many, how many can see this is, this is a crazy thing, isn't it? So we got to protect this house, and then we got to protect this house. Amen? You got to do that. You have to do that. And I'll pray for you. I pray for, man, I'm praying for Hannah's house. I pray for Guy's house. I pray for your houses. I pray for every father, mother, son, daughter. But listen, nobody can pray for your house like you can pray for your house. No one can pray for your kids, mom, like you can pray. Dad, like you can pray. I'm all right about that. So come on, let's rise up and get in the gate. Get in the gate. And all of a sudden, individuals are changing, and now neighborhoods are starting. Can I tell you, this neighborhood's changing, you guys. And it says everywhere the, your foot treads, what I say, everywhere the tread of my tires roll. It's ours. And I drive through this neighborhood proclaiming, this is our neighborhood. This is our neighborhood. This is our neighborhood. Amen? This is our neighborhood. What about your neighborhood? Amen? What about where you work? This is our neighborhood. Everywhere the sole of your feet will tread, I'll give it to you. When you go out walking, I tell the guys when they walk back and forth, the girls walk, everywhere the sole of your feet, this is our land. This is our territory. Amen? In Jesus' name. All right. I see what time it is. I got, I'm doing good. Okay? Uh, <laughs> and so here's the third one. Okay? And I just got a couple more. That don't really look like a church. It kind of does. But I'm a terrible artist, but I'll do it a little bit different. I'll make this a little taller. And then here's what we're going to do. It's called the house of God. But how you know this is the house of God, right? I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your home is the house of God. But guess what? This is the house of God. Protect this house. We're all called to protect this house. This is our church. This is our church. Not my church. It's our church. This is holy ground. Protect this house. Don't come in here being crazy and dis disrespectful. I'm okay. I like to have fun. See, we have, I, have, I, I can see you can't hardly get you guys to stop doing all that. You know, when you're giving people hugs and I thought, dumping and dancing and we were celebrating. Amen. How many of you can have fun? But there's a difference and when you can tell that sometimes a spirit will come in to disrupt. It's a wrong spirit. And I shouldn't be the only one that senses it. We said, whoa, we protect this house. Now, let me just be real careful here. We have to do it with the utmost love and courtesy and kindness because most people don't have a clue, you guys. We can't come in and put all this stuff on a bunch of people, and they're like, what's he talking about? So we got to teach. we got to train. And even with the, with the moms, we got a lot of single moms, got kids. I mean, we got to rally around those moms and kids. But I'm just telling you, God, the devil will use our kids if we don't do something. And they don't even know they're being used, but they'll be running around, jumping around, doing all this crazy stuff. And you're trying, people trying to worship and pray and stuff. And, and, you know, and I'm not saying that, to, but I'm just saying that's where we need to rally 
around our moms and around our dads and say, listen, we will help you. You take care of one, I'll take care of one, and we're going to teach these kids how to worship the Lord. Can I tell you, our kids love to worship God, but they've never told their whole life that they can do it. They've never been instructed. I'm telling you, little kids love to worship God. And you can get them a prayer badge or you can give them a color book. It's your choice. But if you, whatever you tell them to do, whatever you teach them to do, they'll do it. But they can have a God encounter at a young age. And they'll get the pastor, come on. I remember Brookie say, Daddy, Daddy, play that song where we all bow down. That was when she was just a little girl. Because she encountered the living God. And so I want to be a church where we rally around our awesome single moms and we work together to train our children to say, listen, there's a time to respect God. There's a time to honor God and not get religious about it, right? Because we're family. But just say, hey, but we're not, but there are certain times. And how many know, like, there are, there are sh- wolves in sheep's clothing, and then there are spirits that will just come in in people's presence and, and they, they come in to disrupt and dishonor. Or it's a different spirit. You don't hear people talk about this very often. And let me just talk about the church of Kansas City where I was trained a lot. And I'm telling you what, they, they have gatekeepers in that church, spiritual gatekeepers in that church. And if somebody comes in there playing around funny spiritually, I'm telling you, boy, they, they, got, they, got, they got the gatekeepers and they're all around those people. And they say, this is our house, not in this house. We love you. We're glad you're here. But you're not going to come in and disrupt what God's doing. Now, see, there again, we've got to be real careful because you can, you, you know, you got to use love and kindness and gentleness. Because a lot of people don't know. That's a whole different ball game. And they don't know. But there are people who will come in. I call it an agenda disease. They got their own agenda. And they walk in, and they want everybody to think they're wonderful. They'll stand up, and maybe they'll say, thus say it the Lord, and they want everybody to bow down. But what they really want is everybody to look at them. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a right time for that. So, so I'm, I know you don't hear this talked about very much, but how many know? But to my main thing, you guys, is to train and teach, especially when we're worshiping. That's his time. And, man, we try so hard. Some people get them to go to the bathroom 67 times. And I'm like, you don't have to go to the bathroom 67 times. Am I right about that? And, and so, you know, because as soon as somebody gets them to go to the bathroom, it breaks the focus. Or if you start talking while some people are worshiping like this, and all of a sudden somebody starts a conversation, you go like this, and they're going like this. They were worshiping God, but now they're listening to you. You just broke their worship, and now their mind's on you. So how many think, like, see, and, and I know you might not like me for saying this, but I'm fighting for the honor of his name. I want this to be a holy place. And, I, and I'm not mad. I'm not upset. Come on, let's train. Let's teach. Let's love. And let's get this place where even our kids know. When we go in there, it's God time. Amen. And, yes, kids can worship the Lord. Amen. And let me just tell you, they'll fall in love with worship. The devil doesn't want them to worship. But if you just get them here and say, come on, we're going to worship the Lord tonight. But they got to have the whole, and they can have a God encounter. I've seen nine-year-old kids preach the paint off the wall. I've watched seven, six-year-old, seven-year-old kids lay, have, wearing prayer badges, going around praying, laying hands on the sick. Because they were trained and taught, you can be powerful. Right now, we must all become as a little child to enter the kingdom of heaven. And I think the devil has pulled the wool over eyes and he said, We just want to get them out of here so we can have church. Get them kids out of here so we can have some church up in here. You know, like what? How many know? But how many know what that? That's a mistake a lot of the time. Now, there's a right time to do that. Don't get me wrong. But not worship. That's why we have our kids in here. Come on. Let's get them kids in the presence of the Lord. And once they have a God encounter, they'll never be the same. Anybody believe that besides me? And so when it comes to the church, you know, like I said, we've got to be kind and gentle. We, here's the main thing. We've got to watch out for gossip. Ooh, we need some gatekeepers. And, man, you're back there. You're out there in the foyer. Somebody said, man, hey, come, hey, come over here. 
man, I don't know about you, but if I was a pastor of this church, here's what I think they ought to do, and I don't really like what they're doing over here, you know, and I just think this is wrong. What do you think? Woo! Seeds of discord. God hates it. There's seven things that God hates. But the last one he abhors, the one who sows discord among the brothers and sisters. Most churches are not destroyed from without. They're destroyed from within. And we need to have gatekeepers in the church to say, you ain't going to talk about my pastor like that. Now, if you want to talk to him like that, we'll go get him, and that'll be okay. But you need to be looking in his eyes. I mean, we got a direct communication policy around here. If you're going to gossip, if you're going to say something bad, you need to be looking in that person's eyes when you say it and not behind their back or not on the prayer chain. Hey, let me tell you, Sister Susie, about this. Oh, I just said that so you could pray for her. <laughs> I mean, no, that, that's, prayer chains could be deadly. It's quiet in here again. But how many see what I'm saying? Come on. I ain't, come on, let's don't let people devour our brother and sister behind their back. And if people are going to talk, then say, listen, let's go get them right now. Because they need to be in this conversation. I'm not going to talk about them. They're not here. And how many know there's two sides to every story? I learned that the hard way. We need to talk. Because I'm telling you, there's a unity. There's a unity happening, you guys. And we got to protect it. Listen, the world needs to see a church that's getting along. The church needs to see a church that's got each other's backs. You ain't talking about my brother like that. You ain't talking about my sister like that. Amen. We don't do that around here. Amen. We protect this house. If you hear somebody doing that, man, you need to stop it. Say, let's call Pastor Dick right now. Have him come over here. We'll talk about it. You can say anything you want to say about me, but please come and look me right in the eyeball when you say it. Yeah. And I might, if I'm wrong, I'll try to admit, you know, I'll try to do the right thing. Because we just want to get it right. But how many know this is all part of protecting the house against the wrong spirit, gossip, division, and dishonor? You know, Malachi 1.10, and then I, uh, Malachi 1.10, and I challenge you to go home and read Malachi chapter 1 again. Read out the message. If, but you better put your still toe shoes on before you do. Because it is powerful, powerful, powerful. But I just want to read verse 10. It says, why doesn't one of you Stand up. This is, is that the message? Well, I want to put the New King James on there, but I'll, we'll read this first. Why doesn't one of, there it is. <laughs> yeah. Who is there even among you who would stand up, take a stand, and but say, shut the door? Shut the door on what? Disrespect, dishonor, gossip, backbiting, slander, silliness. And I know there's a difference between having fun and being disrespectful. So is there not one, and I believe there's a whole bunch in here, amen? Is there not one who will stand up and shut the door? Say, not in this house. You know, I keep thinking about basketball and Tony and coaches, and I know when the, when the visiting team comes to your home field, to your home court, protect this house. Not in this house. This is God's house. Amen? And the more we treat this with respect and honor, the more God's going to show up. God will not show up in a place where he's not honored. In all these different levels, here, in your home, in your church, okay? In all of these levels, okay? And so, is there not one who will rise up and shut the door? so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept, the message says, your worship, your shoddy, sloppy, half-hearted worship. I won't take it. I won't accept it. How many know he deserves the best? See, to me, when we come in here, we give him everything. This is, this is our big game, Amen. It's crazy people like come in, sit down, say, oh, Pastor, I'm so tired this morning. I've been up playing video games till 3 o'clock. How many think we ought to like bring him our best? Bring him our best. 
You know, you can sleep in tomorrow, man, or whatever. But, you know, like on Sunday morning, I'd be so, man, I'm going to get some sleep. I'm going to get some rest. So when I come into church tomorrow, I'm not coming to get filled. I'm overflowing when I get here. Amen. I'm not coming to get something. I'm coming to bring something. Amen. I know when Terry came bouncing in here this morning, my heart just went, whoo, because I love her. I love her heart. Amen. How many know that's how we all ought to bring that into the house of the Lord? Amen. Just come ready to explode. And we're, she, we weren't even started church yet. And she's already up here joining and dancing and everything. And my heart just leaped inside of me. Because there's somebody coming in, like, understands, you know, like, I love this. So everybody good? Okay. And, and uh, I, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to mention one more here. So the next one is the church. And then... You know, I just want to get started. I want to go to Matthew 23, and we're talking on the church here. And then I'm going to stop here, and then I'm going to finish, and then I'm going to be done with this whole thing, I think, next week, okay? But this is a verse that's kind of negative. We're still talking about the church, okay? It's, and this is Jesus. This is Jesus' own words talking to the religious leaders of his day. Now listen to this, and see if we can't find this in 2020. It doesn't look like it looked like 2,000 years ago. But I believe religion is alive and well. And look what this says. Jesus is talking. But woe. Everybody say woe. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Hypocrites. The scribes and Pharisees. How many know who they were? They were the religious leaders of their day. They were the head of the temple, head of the whole religious system of their day. And Jesus is looking at them and saying, Woe to you, you scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Listen, for you shut the door. You shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourself, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. And I just want to tell you guys, there is a religious spirit that is shutting the door in the face of, of hurting and broken and wounded people. And they have shut up the kingdom of God. And I would say, whoa. I didn't even say it. Jesus said it. Amen. I'm just repeating him. Woe to you, religious people. When people come to the church broken and hurting and wounded, and they get the door slammed in their face. It's a door of religion. Because maybe they're not dressed right or they don't look right or they don't act right or whatever, 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 whatever. And how many of that breaks God's heart and it should break our heart too? And I just, you know, I don't, I don't know about you, that when most people, and I don't think I even did this myself, when most people crash and burn and come to that place of crisis and brokenness, the end of yourself, and you don't know what to do. Your marriage is falling apart. Your kids are falling apart. Your finances are falling. I don't know what you've been through. And everything comes crashing in. And what do people, almost everybody say, you know what, honey? We're going to change. We're, we're going to turn things around. And, honey, this Sunday, we're going to get up, and we're going to go to church. We're going to church. And maybe they're poor. Maybe they don't have nice clothes. And maybe they got tattoos. I don't know. But their hearts are broken. And the first thing they think, how many of people think, I'm going to church? And boy, they show up at the church. And it's not the physical door that gets slammed in their face. It's the spiritual door. They say, oh, you need to go clean up a little bit. You need to go get yourself together. You need to quit that smoking, cussing, chewing, drinking. Come on. And then, then come back and we'll take a vote. And I know I laugh at that, but it's kind of, it's real, isn't it? It's real. And their hearts, listen, they come with a broken heart, but they leave with a more of a broken heart. They come blind, but they leave even more blind. They come sick, but now they they even the hope that they had is taken away from them. And now they say, well, forget church. Church is irrelevant to me. 
You know why I won't go? Because I went. You know why I don't come? Because I came. And when I came, I got the door shut in my face. See, religion shuts the door on the broken and the hurting and the outcasts. And I'm not talking about just drugs. I'm talking about how many know people, it doesn't matter your economic status. Everybody's hurting. People with a lot of money have empty hearts and broken hearts. Some worse than ever. It's not about that. They need Jesus. They need life. They need forgiveness. They need hope. And Jesus said this, if the light becomes darkness, how dark is that darkness? Man, I don't want to be these people. I don't want to be these people. I want to be, see, here's the thing. Religion shuts the door in people's face that are broken and hurting and in need relationship swings the door wide open and say you can come and you can belong before you behave amen you're you we want to be an oasis of love acceptance and forgiveness amen if you come over here the door is going to swing open wide amen you come on in here and we'll we'll go through your mess with you and you go through my mess with me amen amen you help me i'll help you because let me tell you, we're all dysfunctional in some area of our life. Who are you, oh man, that judges another when you yourself do the same thing? See? So, so how many see what I'm saying? We got to be the doorkeeper, amen? And say, we're not going to let religion come in. We're not going to let that religious spirit in. We're, you know, but we are going to swing the gate and the door wide open and say, whosoever will, come on in, come on in. And by the way, you can belong before you behave. How about this? I got some folks, you can belong before you believe. Just hang out and listen. You know, you can leave any time you want. <laughs> you know, but how many, how many are like, that's different, isn't it? See, and that's the way Jesus was. Jesus said, like, if you want me, you can have me. It's a whosoever will kingdom, amen? So how many know, like, we got to protect this house, and I want this house to be, you know, I talked about, you know, we have to make certain judgments, but not that kind of judgment. That's where I do think we need to put a non-judgmental zone, no judgment zone, amen? And what I mean by that is on the outward. Man looks at the outward, but God looks at the heart. That's why I love what we're doing because how many know there's a treasure in everybody? Man, I have been so blessed this week. And, you know, last night I get to go, we to go over to the Access Church. And it's the Nazarene Church. And they, they were great hosts. And it's just this cool setting. And they just play songs mostly up on the screen. But I go almost every Saturday. And I just kind of sit in the back. And I'm like a proud daddy. And, uh, and I just... You know, I just like, I like I'm like i about to pop a button, you know, because I look around and I see these people that came to us completely devastated, broken, empty, lost. And I'm just watching them out there just praising and worshiping God because there's some place they could go where people aren't looking at them from the outside or whatever, or judging or making, you know, but because how many know like it's a whosoever will kingdom and it's the most beautiful. That's the kingdom right there. See, most people out there don't have a God problem. They have a religion problem. They want God. But when they came, they got the door shut in their face. And they're like, whoa, I can't do all that. I already tried to quit all that stuff. The harder I tried, the worst I got. Anybody say amen? Man, I tried to quit cussing. And I tried to quit all that stuff on my own. Couldn't do it. Because I had to. See, religion says you have to. Relation says I want to. So do I hear an amen? And so, you know, to me, uh, we'll stop there. And, and next week I'm going to talk to you, though, about the next level, which is the city. And I love talk about the city. Proverbs 11, 11 says, when the righteous 
Bless the city. The city flourishes. See, I told my wife, and, and I, I don't know if you knew this or not, but when in the priesthood, in the priesthood, if you were a Levite in the Jewish nation of Israel and you were in the priesthood, that when you turn 50, I didn't know this till last week, when you turn 50, the priests no longer did their daily duties in the temple, but once you turn 50, you took your place in the gate, in the city gate. And I believe that God is raising up pastors in this town, Pastor Jim and Pastor Charles. People, Pastor Charles, we've spent our whole life in this community. And I told him the other day, I said, Pastor Charles, we need to take our place in the gate. Pastor Jim, Pastor Mark, Pastor Brian, Pastor Bo, we're spiritual leaders. And it's time to take our place over this city. To go and get our place in the gate. And I told my wife, I said, we're coming into a season of our life, Lisa, where God's saying, it's time for us to take our place in the gate. As spiritual. But see, our church, so I believe in our church ain't nothing. There's great churches everywhere. But God put us right here in this town, just like every other great church, every other great pastor, and we got a job to do, and that is to open up these heavenlies, to take this atmosphere, and take this city in Jesus' name, take this county, take this state. Why not go ahead and just touch the whole nation? Because why not us? It's got to start somewhere. I believe it's starting already in a bunch of places. But I won't be a part of that, Amen. This should be a stronghold for the kingdom. Do you know there are angels ascending and descending freely right now? Do you know we have an open heaven? We, I'm not praying for to get one. This city is blessed. Quit speaking death to this city. And by the way, quit speaking death to yourself. Quit speaking death to your marriage. Quit speaking death to your home. Quit speaking death to your church. Quit speaking death to your community. Quit speaking death to our government, our leaders. Life. Life and death is in the power of your tongue. You were created in God's image. You create your world with your words. You create the atmosphere in your home with your words. Do I hear an amen? All right, let's stand. Let's stand. And the next week, though, we're going to do one more. And we'll talk to you about the third, the three heavens. Paul said, I know a man, whether it was in the body or out of the body, I don't know. But this guy, he's talking about himself, was caught up into the, everybody say, third heaven. And we're going to talk about the three heavens and how that part of the reason we're here on the earth is to see the heavens open, the first heaven, the second heaven, all the way to the third heaven, to where there is an open heaven and the windows of heaven, the doors swing wide, you heavenly gates, and let the king of glory come in. Hmm, I wonder who keeps that gate. I wonder who's in control of the heavenly gate church. See, there's all these different levels, but it starts right here. So how many ready to go to work this week? You know, I used to teach this all the time. I heard Stephen Furtick, he did this with his church too. He said, here's my challenge to you this week. I want you to, 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 to be aware of this whole process, and here's my assignment. I want you to capture a thought and set up trial and literally go through a process of say, you know what? This week, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get back in the gate. Everybody say, I'm back. Yeah. You may have had the worst thing in your life happen. You may have more regret than you've ever had in your life. You may be broken and hurting and messed everything up, but it don't matter. Just get up and say, you know what? I'm back in the gate again. Amen? I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. And this week... I'm going to be the gatekeeper to my house. And I'm going to catch me some thoughts this week. I'm going to capture some thoughts. I am going to think about what I think about this week. How about this? I'm going to get me some gaps going on. Where you've been struggling. 
I'm going I'm to catch an anger thought, and I'm going to hold my tongue. I'm not going to say that to my husband. I'm not going to say that to my wife. Amen? So let's just pray right now. Holy Spirit, come right now. The Holy Spirit's the bouncer of all bouncers. <laughs> Holy Spirit will help you be the best gatekeeper you can be. The Holy Spirit will say, no, not that one, not that one. Don't say that. Don't say that. Yeah, say this. Say this. Holy Spirit will be your guide. He'll be your helper. He'll help you be the best gatekeeper and doorkeeper you can be. So Holy Spirit, come right now. Come, Holy Spirit. Touch our minds. Mind of Christ. Mind of Christ. Listen, you have the mind of it's the Holy Spirit. Where's he at right now? He's in you. You've got the mind of Christ in you right now. And you just got to tap into it. Jesus, help me think like you think. Help me see like you see. Help me talk like you talk, Jesus. Help me walk like you walk. Help me to see others how you see others. Holy Spirit, take over. Take over my life. Take over my marriage. Take over my kids. Take over my home, my neighborhood, this church, this community, this county, this state. Thank you for what you're doing in America. Hallelujah. Move. This is a move, you guys. This is a move of God that's happening. This is a move of God. We're a part of it right now. This is a move of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Holy Spirit, touch our eyes to see, our ears to hear. Lead us, guide us. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.